Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, Frain, for those nice comments. Uh, I have known Frain for a long time, and I think his commitment to the cooperative uh, industry is, is fantastic, and we need people like that to continue the movement going forward. Today, I'm going to talk about electricity. Uh, so, one of the things that uh, we focus on every day is, is powering our members' lives. And I'm going to just take you uh, into a little exercise here, if you don't mind, uh, starting off with. So, bear with me. The screen is black. So everyone, uh, please close your eyes and think for a moment. Imagine, imagine using your senses to appreciate a day in a life with electricity. In the morning, you're awakened by the sound of music or maybe an annoying alarm. You then see the light in your bathroom and proceed to take a warm, relaxing shower. Dry off and blow dry your hair. Once ready, you proceed into the kitchen to start a coffee maker so you can smell the aroma of a fresh cup of coffee, a piece of cinnamon toast, some fresh bacon and eggs. As you prepare your breakfast, you turn on the TV to hear the morning news. After finishing your morning rituals, you're on your way out the door. Grab your cell phone, which was charged overnight, to take on the day. Of course, the garage door opened by electricity to get you out the door. All your morning activities were powered by electricity, sometimes taken for granted, but essential in today's world. I believe it is important for everyone to be reminded of the value of electricity plays in our lives every second of the day. My lecture today will focus on the value of electricity, why cooperatives are best suited to supply it. So th thank you for participating in that exercise this morning. So I'm going to go through a, a few things today in my presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey, uh, not too much, but a little bit. Uh, a little bit about the history of cooperatives. Um, look at our industry structure, what it really takes to provide electricity to our membership. The role of Cass County Electric, more specifically. Careers in electric cooperatives. For those students in the room, I'll share some opportunities there for you. And then I'll just close with a little, uh, little update on our recent ice storm that we've had uh, back around the Christmas time. So that's the, that's the agenda for today, and I hope you, hope you enjoy it. And if you don't, well, it is what it is. <laughs> So starting off, so I, uh, I've had, had the fortune of living in this, in this area in my entire career. So I actually grew up south of Castleton in a really small town called Lynchburg. It's basically an elevator and five houses. I went to college at NDSCS uh, in Wahpeton, and I have a two-year associate's degree, uh, and that's, that's my formal education. I started my career at Cass County Electric in, in 1986. And as what Frayne mentioned earlier, I started as a load management technician. And that position was designed, that was a, it was a new position, to do maintenance on our ripple control systems for off-peak heating. You guys are looking at me, what is that? Anyway, I was just out to maintain uh, our, our systems as a technician, and I did that for about four years. And then as, as we continued to grow uh, the electric heating market kind of in our rural areas of our, our cooperative, we, we felt we needed to market that more. So I, I actually became a marketing representative and was in that role for about 10 years. And we really explained the value of electric heating and water heating to our, our members, our builders, contractors, whatever. I spent a lot of time doing that. Then moved into a role as, as a marketing manager to oversee that area and expand uh, s my, my role into helping with key accounts. Eventually became a key accounts executive where there we worked with our top 100 accounts, really to make sure that they were taken care of. They were, this was at a time when there was customer choice being talked about in the utility industry. And we wanted to make sure that our key accounts liked us. And I think we did a good job making sure they did. After that, I was promoted to a Vice President of Member and Energy Services to oversee our marketing and communications team, our energy management team, economic development at the time, and our billing, billing and accounts area. And from there, I, I was named CEO in 2016, 
after our past CEO, Scott Handy, who is here today, by the way. Scott Handy, raise your hand. Scott Handy's our past CEO of Cass County Electric. So I, I learned everything from him, so I'm grateful for his, his past leadership. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm going to talk a little more about, you know, kind of what, what drove me in my career to do the things that, that I've done. And I, I guess I'll go way back. You know, I, I grew up uh, in, in a family of, of contractors. My, my dad and my grandfather were building contractors. They, they serviced the rural community of Cass County at the time and really learned the values of, of hard work, uh, being efficient, and enjoy life and perform good work. And those basic values of life is really what has driven me in every stage of my career to the best I can be in every position I've had. I also played sports. And I, I bring that up today because I think playing sports is important. Uh, for, for me, it kind of brought me the value of leadership. You know, if you play sports on a team, if you're a captain of a basketball team or a football team, your teammates are relying on you. And I think that type of a background is really important in life. And, I, and playing sports taught me a lot about uh, doing the right things and being a leader in, this, in, in our world. As, as was mentioned, I look at uh, continuous process improvement. I think that's really important, something we've really focused on at our cooperative to make sure that we don't, don't just settle for status quo. We're always looking for ways to improve. Communicate effectively. I mean, that's as, about as important as you can get it. Uh, communication is everything in this world. We gotta make sure those that we're dealing with know what's going on and why. Positive attitude. You know, we all have the opportunity when we walk in the door or come to a meeting or do whatever we do, it's up to us to come with the attitude we, we wanna bring to that event or that situation. And to have the positive attitude makes everything just that much better. And constant learning. I'll talk about that next. So these are just a few of the certifications. I probably have some more, but just some more noted ones that I've, I've obtained over the, over the years that has helped me in the position I was at to perform at the highest level I could at the time. So one of the things that we pushed a lot back in the 90s was uh, electric heating, more specifically ground source heat pumps. You know, so that was kind of just coming into fruition as a new technology. So I became a certified installer to put in ground source heat pumps. Only put in two in my whole life, but I was actually a certified installer. <laughs> uh, energy auditing. So we want to make sure as a, we want to be the energy experts. So we, we did, took a lot of training to make sure we could be energy experts in our field, be it if it was someone, a new house or a commercial building. So I became a commercial energy auditor. And eventually through the Association of Energy Engineers, he had some training uh, for that. And another area in that was a certified energy manager. That's a designation that a lot of mechanical engineers get in their profession. So again, more to gain knowledge and get credibility as is someone that actually knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and towards the end of my career, it was more uh, focused on leadership. You know, so we had some training programs uh, through our national organization called the Management Internship Program. That's a six-week program that we send uh, managers through to get training on cooperatives. Uh, we went through a strategy execution master class and a lot of our key staff did as well to basically allow us to get training on setting a strategic plan and a roadmap for the cooperative's future. And uh, my recent training was probably about five years ago was more the Gettysburg leadership experience. Again, a leadership training about the Civil War and how that all un un unveiled. But anyway, that's a little background on what, what's important I think for lifelong learning to help those in your careers to do the best you can be, or be the best you can be. So the keys to success is continuous learning. Be ready for the opportunities because you never know when a door opens. In my, my career, I've had a lot of door opening opportunities and I happen to be the right person at the time to go through that door. It doesn't always happen, so I was very lucky from that perspective. Commitment, I'm, a, I'm someone that it says if I'm gonna do it, I do it. I, don't, I rarely back down to something I don't commit to. I think that's really important. And having connections. And that's, I've spent my entire career making connections with people. And I think that's probably put me in the seat I was in uh, for the last eight years. So why were electric cooperatives formed? You know, if we look back, uh, 
in the in the 1930s, you know, what did people want? Well, the people in the rural rural area wanted what the people in the cities had, and that's electricity. You look at what was done before electricity was uh, in the rural areas. You know, nine out of ten homes didn't have electricity. Farmers would milk cows by hand in dim light or no light at all. You know, we we washed clothes not with machines. You know, you, you just don't think about that stuff until we're reminded of those things. And as far as cooperatives go, we're, I mean, our, our main focus is we're focused on people and not profits. You know, I think that's the value of a cooperative uh, in, our, in our world, especially in our industry. So you've, a lot of you have seen this. You know, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but the seven cooperative principles are really what drive us to do what we do every day. And there's probably a few here that I'll pro probably focus on more uh, than, than others today. You know, democratic control is really important. Uh, cooperation among cooperatives, uh, concern for community. There's others on here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're all just really important and, and drive, again, what we do every day. So looking back in time, you know, cooperative has been around for a really long time, back in the, to the 1800s. And really for electric cooperatives uh, in, in the United States, if you look back about 1930, Five is when President Roosevelt uh, created the Rural Electrification Act. And that really was the start of electric cooperatives across the nation. So Cass County Electric was formed in 1937 by a group of local farmers in the Kindred area that decided we want to have power just like those in the, in the big cities do. So that was the start of Cass County Electric. Uh, as you can see, there's many other milestones in there that electricity kept ex expanding across the country and today we serve a lot of them. I'll get to show you that in a little bit how much we serve today. I want to make a point. So my cooperative roots run deep. So back in the 1940s my my grandfather actually wired homes that brought electricity to our rural membership down in the Enderlin Fort Ransom area. So I, I kind of have a little bit of co-op blood in me you might say uh, because of what he did and just that value he brought to, to, to my mind. I remember the day that I, I came, came home and announced that I got hired at Cass County Electric. I was really excited. And my grandpa said to me, that's a great place to work. I think he was right. <laughs> Rural electrification, you know, that, that is really what we're known for, the REA. I mean, the old timers in our, our industry refer to us as the REA. Um, Anyway, that's the, when I used to go to places, oh, the REA's here. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> so electric co-ops across the country. Uh, so right now, you can see the landmass of cooperatives across the country. There's, we cover a lot of landmass, but not near as many people. Our, our country has over 300 million people. Co-ops uh, supply about 42 million of those. There are about 832-ish uh, electric cooperatives across the country. Uh, that supply electricity, and we power over 21 million homes and businesses. So the, this model is, took off since the 30s and is doing a great job providing elect electrification across the country. And one thing, we, we, we returned more than $1.4 billion in capital credits in, in 2021. I'll talk about capital credits a little later. So really what, what makes up the power industry? So we have to look at you know, power plant generation. We look at uh, transforming that power, transmitting it over power lines to another substation to actually bring it to the home. So there's a multi-step process that's, that's involved in bringing electricity to uh, homes and businesses across uh, the region. And there's many different corporate structures. So the original cooperatives were more investor-owned utilities, and I'll just give examples there. That would be more like Otterkill Power or Excel Energy. Um, municipals like Moorhead Public Service, you know, they've been in, around for a long time, longer than we have. But cooperatives, like I said, it started in the 30s. And, you know, for, from our, our power delivery, it's Cass County Electric in Minn Kota, really in partnership. So. We look at Minn Kota and Cass, and we're, we are owned and controlled by our members. You know, so whatever we do, whatever money we invest, 
our members have to come up with that money and they're billed back in rates. So be it Minn Kota investing something with power supply or Cass County Electric investing in whatever, our members have to pay for it. There's no subsidies for that at all, no grants to support it, it's all member supported. And again, our focus is on people, not profits. So looking at the cooperative structure from a generation perspective, uh, Minn Kota Power Cooperative and Mac McLennan, our, their CEO is here, so Mac, raise your hand. Mac provides us power. So they produce power uh, through self-generation with coal. They have purchased power agreements for wind and hydro and market purchases through uh, MISO, which is a mid-continent mid independent system operator, which is an RTO. And we get most of our power probably from the top two genera uh, self-generation and purchase power agreements, probably, I'll show you that, 97%. So Minn Kota has been around for, since what date, Mac, was it? 84 years. 84 years, okay, we got you beat. We're, we've been here longer. <laughs> so one thing that, I don't know, Mac probably knows this, but our first power supply didn't come from Minn Kota Power. It came from Valley City Municipal. So we actually had a line, a transmission line from Valley City to an area called Warren, right southwest of West Fargo, is where we had our first power brought in. Then eventually Minn Kota took over <laughs> and has been doing a great job since. <laughs> so Minn Kota Wholesale Power, so they serve uh, parts of 11 cooperatives in northwest uh, Minnesota, northeast North Dakota, uh, serve about 35,000 square miles in, in 33 counties and 400-ish employees, I think a little above 400, but, and those are employees that not only work at their service or center in Grand Forks, but at the power plant out, out in center North Dakota. This is their generation resources. Uh, we have uh, three coal plants that we get power from, uh, three major wind farms uh, in Ashtabula, Langdon, and out by center, and then we have two smaller wind turbines, which were the first utility-scale wind turbines in North Dakota. <laughs> In, in Petersburg and Valley City. This makes up the power capacity that Minn Kota uh, sub, uh, sends to this region. Uh, totals up to be about 1,400 megawatts of power. And this is a capacity rating and not so much, not energy, it's, I'll show you what that means in a little bit, but coal has been our driving force for baseload power and power supply for this region. Over the past, well, it's probably been 15 years now, that wind has been has added to that as well and I'll show you what makeup that is right now. So currently from a capacity perspective, Minn Kota gets about 8% of their capacity from hydro, which is the Garrison Dam, uh, about 55% from coal today, and about 34% from wind, and that's capacity or the nameplate rating uh, from the power supply. Well, one thing we do know is that we think the wind blows all the time, but it doesn't. You know, so we only get about 19% of the energy from wind, about 67, 68% from coal, and about 11% from hydro. So that's the general makeup. When, when one of our members uses electricity, that's approximately where their resources come from today. So next is transmitting. So I talked about the three, three legs of the stool, basically, in transmission. You know, Minn Kota delivers power from uh, 252 substations around the region you know, from International Falls to Oaks, North Dakota, or not quite Oaks, but down in that pretty, pretty broad area. Uh, and they supply about 3,300 miles a line, and they have supply voltages at different levels based on, you know, what their, the areas they're supplying. So their main, main high voltage system is 345 and 220 kilovolts, and their other transmission is 115 and 69 kV. This, 69 is really what goes around our the rural parts of our service territories to, to supply our substations generally. And then is Cass County Electric. So we're the distribution part of this. So when, when Minn Kota sends power to a substation, our role as a distribution cooperative is to take that power from the substation and deliver, deliver it to the homes and businesses. There are 44 distribution cooperatives in Minnesota and 16 in North Dakota that do the same thing that we do. This shows a map here where they're located in North Dakota. You know, again, Cass County Electric. So we, we serve about 40 miles north of Far Fargo, about 40 miles south, and about 80 miles west, and then it kind of meanders around the Cheyenne River Valley to the south of us is kind of our general service territory. I'll show, this, show you that next. <laughs> this is a little more detail of that. 
in some of the communities that we, we do serve. Within, within our service territory, there Otter Tail serves parts of cities, NSP does, and a municipality like Valley City Municipal serves some of the inner parts there too, but that's generally our service area in those colored, colored, different colored areas you see on that map. So like I said earlier, we've been around since 1937. We have service centers in Valley City, Arthur, Kindred, Lisbon, and Fargo. And we do that to make sure that we can respond to outages quick by having service centers scattered throughout our service territory, we have linemen that can go out and respond to outages as quick as they can and as safe as they can. We serve today over 58,000 accounts. Uh, back in 1986 when I started at CASP, we served about 11,000 accounts. We've grown significantly over the years because of the service territories, more specifically around Fargo, West Fargo, and now Horace. If you've driven down to Horace lately, it's growing like crazy. We uh, get our power from NCOTA, and we're also a member of the North Dakota Rural Electric Cooperatives Association. So who is Cass County Electric? You know, we're a distribution cooperative, like I said. You know, we're governed and regulated by our nine-member board of directors, and we have several directors here. So board of directors from Cass County Electric, please raise your hand and thank them for their service. Uh, they do a phenomenal job representing the membership uh, and giving me the right direction. <laughs> Not too much, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> so just to break down kind of the role of the board, uh, and some of you students may have seen some of this. Uh, you know, one thing I'll just remind everyone here, this, today this is really about the students. We, we want to share with, with all of you what, what co-ops are all about, and hopefully you'll gain some information today that's useful in your careers. So our, our goal as electric cooperatives, we have our members. Our members are everything like I talked earlier. Then comes the board of directors representing the member, and then they hire a person like me, the CEO, to make sure that I fulfill the mission that the board has set out. And of course, we have the phenomenal employees that we have that do the work for us every day. And we do have a few employees here today too, so the employees of Cass County Electric, please raise your hand. Again, I have great support for, from our employee group and can't be more happy with what they do every day. So the role of the board is, you know, governments, governance versus management. So the governance is really estab establishing broad uh, goals, establish policy. We have a lot of policies at, at Cass County Elect that, Electric that are reviewed periodically to make sure they're the right policy for the time. Uh, we set limits, budgets, and rules, and hires the CEO. So I, I, I'm retiring next week, if you didn't know this. And we have a gentleman in the room who has took over for me, and his name is Paul Mathis. So Paul Mathis, raise your hand. He will be the new CEO of Cass County Electric next week. <laughs> in the management, uh, we act as uh, within policy limits to achieve the goals set out by the board uh, and report back results at the end of the year. So the role of the board uh, looks a lot at financials, a uh, very important role at the board. We spend a lot of time talking about financials in the boardroom, from budgets to rate services to loans, compensation plans, construction work plans, that to, to know we spend a lot of money in construction work plans. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we borrow a lot of money from the federal government to put that uh, plant, we call it, in, in the ground or overhead. We do financial and IT audits to make sure we're doing the right thing from both financial and, and infor information technology perspectives. We have a lot of memberships in other organizations to support uh, our industry. And of course, capital credits. Our, we set capital credit policies and fulfill those, those policies. So what are capital credits? You know, in our industry, I don't know if everyone here uses capital credits, but the electric cooperative world does. So, you know, when you look at our excess revenues, our margins from the previous year are allocated to uh, our, our members based on their portion of the revenue, our margins at the end of the year. So, for example, if we had a million dollars in margin and uh, a member had a thousand dollars bill for the year, their percent of that would be a million divided into a, a thousand would be their percent of that margin in the future when it's paid out. So we're about 20 years out on paying out capital credits right now. You know, and that's pretty typical for electric cooperatives. Some are higher, but 20, 25 years is pretty typical. In 2023, uh, we, we paid out a record amount of capital credits to our membership. Uh, $4 million in 2020, 
2023 and 2024 to 3.5 million. So we kind of base it based on the amount of money we have left over maybe at the end of the year is the right way to phrase that versus how much we pay out. And, but it is a high, high priority. Our, our board has looked at this and I have too as this is a really important part of being a cooperative member to make sure we pay capital credits. And we do, we've done a great job increasing that amount over the years. And of course, getting that capital credit check is a benefit as a member owner. So when I looked at my bill last month, it was negative $55, meaning back in 2001 or two, I had a pretty high electric bill, <laughs> evidently for that year, so I didn't have to pay much. I didn't have to pay anything this last past month. So the role of the ward, again, is, uh, is the CEO is the res sole responsibility. So th really, if there's an issue with any employee or any issue at the CAS, the board goes through the CEO, not so much with the employees. And I think that's the way it should be. Okay. They do need clear directions, though. So it, when I get a direction from the board, I need to know exactly what they want. I don't, you know, and they've done that. Our board is fantastic about, about making sure that I understand exactly what they're after. So my role as the CEO then, uh, looking at uh, the business plan for the cooperative is to make sure we fulfill that. And so we look at a mission, vision, and values really for the cooperative. Uh, our, our mission statement, if you, if you say it, would be our members' energy needs, to serve our members' energy needs with affordable and reliable electricity. That is something we do every day, and I think we do a fantastic job with that. In our world, we also want to be a leader. So when we look at um, what we want to be a leader in, we want to be a leader in safety. We want to be a leader in service, reliability, data security, financial management, employee engagement. That's what drives our cooperative, and, we, I th and that's what I think about every day when, when I go to work, to make sure we're doing just those things. We have core values of safety, accountability, integrity, commitment to community, and innovation, and those, these two also drive us as a concern for community, uh, as a cooperative. So affordability uh, objectives, you know, we, as talked about earlier, we want to make sure we are being prudent, fair, and responsible with our members' money. It's really, really number one for us. Embrace and continue Continuous, pr continuous process improvement, utilize technology. We have a lot of technology at our cooperative that has really improved the efficiency. If you look at our cooperative 20 years ago, we had about 20,000 accounts and we had about, I don't know, 98 employees, something like that. Today we have 58,000 accounts and we have 94-ish employees, somewhere in there. <laughs> so we actually have less employees than we did 20 years ago. But we have implemented numerous technologies that have allowed us, allowed us to be more efficient. We always want to sell more kilowatt hours too, so we're trying to look at new ways to do that. Um, we've invested a lot in the economic development. I've served on the Greater Fargo Market more Economic Development Board for the last 10 years uh, to make sure that the far city of Fargo and the rest surrounding communities continue to grow. And we have done that. We grow on average about 1,600 accounts a year, which is really high compared to the average co cooperative across the nation. And promoting electri electrification. So we're seeing things like electric vehicles. We're seeing more data centers going in. There's lots of electric loads and even probably more heating in the future. I mean, heating was quite prevalent for us historically, but our rates have gone up a little bit, so there are, we're probably not as competitive. But it's kind of a national movement to use more electricity for various things like that. We also try to control our costs to make sure uh, we're operating efficiency, if, uh, control our, our operating costs, our controllable expenses might be a better term to use. And I'll show you what we talk about our distribution adder and how we compare with our peers. And this is something that Scott Handy put together a long time ago. And we continue to monitor this all the time to make sure we're doing the right things and operating efficiencies efficiently. I'll show you what I mean by that here next my, my next slide. So this is what we call our, our distribution adder. So if you look at, you know, our, our distribution adder, uh, which is really our fixed costs and operating costs divided by our kilowatt hour sales. And that comes up to be about 2.21 cents per kilowatt hour for 2023. And if you look at the past 20 years, it's been flat. And you wonder how can a company, you know, just with inflation, not have their costs go up? 
You know, the reason we can do that is because we're growing. Most co-ops don't grow the way we do, and we, so therefore we've been able to keep that flat along with numerous investments in technology and to, to be as efficient as we can. But what's interesting with this graph is the line on the red line on the graph are cooperatives our size across the country. So either they're doing something wrong or we're really doing something right. Their average distribution adder was 3.8 cents or 38 mils and ours, ours was 23. What does that mean annually for our member owners? a savings of over $21 million annually just by operating the cooperative as efficient as we can. That's a really cool slide. Next is reliability. So we want to make sure not only our members can afford to pay their bill, we want to make sure that it's on as much as can be. We have a goal to be on 99.99% .99 of the time. That's a pretty aggressive goal. But we, we have done that historically. Uh, in fact, we, for the last five years, I think we've been in the top, number one in the nation twice, and second a couple times, and of course this year, I'll, I'll talk about that, but <laughs> December 24th, we were on track to have the best reliability year on record of Cass County Electric, and then Mother Nature threw us an ice bomb <laughs> and caused a lot of problems, and I'll talk a little bit more, more about that towards the end of my presentation here today. But what, what factors really influence uh, reliability? You know, and that goes down to our distribution design. So we have our own in-house engineering, and one of the gentlemen actually is an NDSU graduate, Troy, Troy Knudsen, and Jody Bullinger are, are, are in charge of our engineering. They just do a fantastic job uh, designing our system to make sure that it's resilient. We invest in technology when we invest a lot in maintenance from tree trimming to plant or underground lines replacement to whatever is needed to make sure that our system is as resilient as it can be. And we have a lot of committed employees. So when we do have an outage, they, they work as hard as they can and do a great job restoring, restoring power. So those, those factors really influence uh, reliability. Finance, you know, that that's... <laughs> We borrow a lot of money every year, uh, so securing financing for building, maintaining, uh, and replacing our system is really important. We have ongoing financial monitors and accounting functions in place, and, and whatever money we do have or we draw from our, our fin financial sources, we reinvest until we need to use it, and that's, that's been a model we've worked on for, for years. So where do we get our money from? You know, so we're not the average borrower. We actually borrow through the federal government. Uh, so we get the majority of our financing through RUS, which is through the USDA, and they provide us a, a, a very fair rate for financing uh, our, our cooperative business model. We also have borrowed through the National Rural Ut Utilities Cooperative Finance Corporation uh, and CoBank for farm credit leasing. You know, so there's several financial partners we use to make sure we can operate uh, as low cost as we possibly can. From an operations perspective, I said earlier, we add about 1,600 accounts per year. That takes a lot of investment in new utility plant. We added about 16 to $20 million, depending on, on the year, of new infrastructure to feed some of these growth areas in Fargo, West Fargo, Horace, and replacing infrastructure in our rural areas. A very important part of our operations team is our linemen, our, our linemen. You know, they, they're the folks that have to go out when the weather's bad. They're, they're the folks that make sure that when there is an outage that it's put on, as, as put back as quick as we can. But to assist them, we also have a 24-7 power control center. We're one of the few cooperatives in, in this region that actually has someone there 24-7 making sure that our system is operating uh, as good as it can be. From an engineering perspective, again, you know, we've designed and monitored our system for reliability. We use what's called a SCADA system. Uh, that's super, supervisory control and data acquisition. This is a way for us to monitor each substation to make sure all of our feeders have power, what the voltage levels are, what the current levels are. We have a, it's kind of a, a heartbeat or a pulse beat of our entire 
infrastructure by having a SCADA system out there. We are in the process of adding to that, which it's, it's a system called Flizzer, and that will allow us to incorporate a somewhat self-healing network, you might say. So if there is an outage in, in, in the metro, this Flizzer system can actually isolate that outage and backfeed power to customers without alignment even going out there to touch it. So it can, re it can reduce the outage. We still have the outage that we have to go fix, but instead of maybe 2,000 people out of power, maybe there's only 200. So it's really a neat technology we're just starting to invest in, and that's going to only improve our reliability numbers going forward in the future. We also do the normal things that other businesses do as we market. You know, so we have uh, selling core services. You know, like I said earlier, where electric heating was big, but water heating is also a big load for us. And we continue to promote the, promote the use of electric water heaters. We assist members with energy uh, efficiency and conservation advice. Communication, I, I'll talk about that in a little bit when I talk about the ice storm. But we still have to portray a, a positive image to the public. And we do a great job with our social media. Jo Jocelyn is here from our communications team that manages that. Uh, it's really important uh, to make sure that we're using all the channels we can to get our message out to our membership and the general public. Legislative communications, you know, part of my role over the past eight years is involved with public outreach. And that means legislative visits with both national and local uh, legislators to make sure that they support uh, issues that are important to electric cooperatives. So that's one of the big things that I've done over the past eight years as well. Information security, you know, that is something that is more prevalent today than it's ever been. And we take this extremely serious at Cass County Electric. Uh, we have our Vice President of uh, Information Security, Tim, uh, Tim is here, right? Yes, yes. We, we, we would just, it's just so important, the last thing you ever want to do is get compromised, and I know you all know this, but this, it's, it's top of mind and we're doing a lot of the right things there. Human resources, uh, that, as all businesses are struggling with right now, they're struggling to find people and talent and train them, uh, develop them, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit, but Ter Teresa's here uh, from our human resources team as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about more directed at the students. So when you look at, at the cooperative industry, you know, we're just not linemen. We're every facet of a business. And when you think about cooperatives, it's a pretty good place to work. You know, I, not just electric, but all cooperatives in general. And, and you look at our business, we have accounting and finance, we have engineering, we have business administration, marketing, communications, human resources, information security, they're all up there. You know, we, we, we have all those people. We have a lot of specialty electric, electrical technology employees at our, at our cooperative that probably don't have four-year degrees, but very specialized electrical technology degrees. So quite a variety, you know, customer service. Uh, when, when somebody calls up, they need a, a warm body to talk to and they get that. Uh, so anyway, there's just a lot, lot of opportunities in the cooperative world for students to take advantage of because it's a, it's a great place to work. Why? Because it's a, we have business stability. We, we are not a, so much in competition. We're kind of a monopoly. <laughs> we, we don't work that way, but we are. Uh, so that, but that provides business stability. And you know, we, not that we don't look at performance, but it, 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 it is something that's really important. Excellent pay and benefits. Uh, we're member focused, mem member centric maybe is another term. We have a, a culture to serve. You know, I, I think that's, and a lot of people like that. I would say we're family oriented. I think I, I've been here for 38 years and I, I think I'm getting divorced from my family next week is kind of what it is for, because it is, you know, you're, when, you're, when you work at a place for that long, it's just part of your family. And I think the training and development opportunities are incredible, you know, that our in industry has to offer for, for employees is, is just fantastic. And we think it's an excellent, excellent work environment too. So <laughs> anyway, that's my sales pitch. <laughs> Frank said I could do that. <laughs> 100%. So shifting gears a little bit. So in, in our industry, we have, there's some challenges out there. And if you look at 
you know, what, what's, what's coming up for both probably more Minn Kota a little bit, but CAS too, is public policy plays a huge role. It has forever in our industry. But what's it going to mean in the future? You know, what happens to these carbon rules that are out there where we're still burning coal? What do we do, you know, to replace that with something different? Uh, there's rules coming out potentially on CO2 or uh, regional haze, you know, things like that you, you probably don't even know about or ever worry about, but, but we do because it's a very, very expensive change to do something like that. I'm not going to get into a lot of power supply stuff today, but there are some things on in the future that we are working on and, and concerned about. Grid security, you know, is there's a lot more threats to the grid today than there ever has been, and, and to harden that and prevent that is is really difficult, but it's something we do definitely to keep in mind. The other thing with power supply is that as power supply continues to change, meaning going away from our baseload resources to more intermittent sources, is there are concerns that we may not have, have enough power availability during peak conditions. So for example, uh, if it's extremely cold out across the central part of the United States, and you might remember a Texas event back in 2001, when there was really no wind, and it was colder than, you know, you know what, Cold, the weather we get in North Dakota, <laughs> all the way to Texas, <laughs> it, it was really, 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 really close that day to having a blackout, a major USA blackout. It was with, within seconds of that happening. And that was because of the power supply that we have today isn't as resilient maybe as we need it to be. And we're, we're concerned about the future. If, as we continue to close more baseload power plants, specifically coal, uh, and natural gas and even nuclear, the intermittent sources just aren't always there. And those are things that leaders like Mac and others are going to have to figure out to make sure that we can keep our lights on. But anyway, I just want to make sure this is, a, this is a concern for our industry. And of course, physical and cybersecurity, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a continued concern. Talked about this a little bit, but even comp remaining competitive. So if we're going to have to switch sources, say we go away from our legacy resource of coal and go to something else, what does that mean for rates? So if we have to reinvest in a power system to replace coal, even if it's natural gas, it's very expensive. You know, so it, rates could potentially, I don't know if they double, but it, 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 they could go up significantly by having to go away or reinvest in something else. It's not millions, it's probably over a billion dollars to get to a new system for the, re the supply that's needed to supply Minn Kota's system in the future. So huge challenges there. Um, and we don't know how long we can continue to use resources. So we're looking at one option to add to the uh, Milton R. Young station would be to look at putting in carbon capture that would potentially allow that system to run maybe another 20 years. Uh, that would and that would uh, capture and sequester CO2 that would be stored in the ground. That's one option that's being looked at to, in the future. And I think we will see probably more wind uh, and more solar. Uh, and really, what is what are batteries? Where, where are they going to go? They're not they're not ready yet. They're re they're expensive. They're short term storage. Someday, if we have battery technology that can store energy for a long periods of time, I'm, I'm talking days. And if it's affordable to build it, and it's reliable to last for decades, it could be a game changer. We're just not even close to being there yet, so we need some time for that to evolve. Some of the other concerns maybe we have are growth-related issues. You know, some of these massive data centers take up huge amounts of power. You may have heard of some stories out in Western North Dakota where they're having to add transmission or generation just to feed some of these new data centers. So that, that's kind of a concern too. Bitcoin mining is, is, is not so much a data center, but that, that we have one pretty large or a couple large Bitcoin mining loads up in Grand Forks right now. But who knows where that'll go. And electric vehicles are kind of the unknown too. I think they're going to probably deploy, deploy slower in our region compared to other parts of the country. Um, and I will see evolution on battery technology that will even improve electric vehicles as well. And just electric, electrification of the economy is something we're keeping, keep, keeping an eye on. So some of the positives, most people in the United States have electricity. Around the world, that is not the case. There's 
billions of people in the world that still do not have electricity. So we're very fortunate in the U.S. We're very competitive. You know, I think that, that will hopefully stay that way for quite a while. We feel we do a great job as, as providing great service to our members and really look at them as a customer, member, uh, in, in a friendly manner. And we've not are making huge strides. We have made huge strides in technology. We are way ahead of the game when it comes to comparing our technology level today compared to the investor-owned utilities in this region. We've had automated meter reading uh, for the past eight years, and a lot of these local investor-owned utilities are just putting that in. So we're probably eight years ahead of the game in some cases. January 24th was, you know, Christmas Eve, and 20, the 25th, the ice storm began, and I, I looked out the window, and it's, it's in raining, and I looked at our, our outage viewer, it's like, you know, this just isn't good if it's raining and it's 28 degrees outside, and the ice kept building and building and building and building and building, and pretty soon uh, we noticed more outages and more outages, and as you can see in this picture, this is what the ice ended up doing. It was probably two, three inches thick on the power lines. That's not a good day when something like that happens. <laughs> the timing couldn't have been worse uh, on Christmas Day when it started. Um, you know, a lot of employees were home on vacation, um, but that doesn't mean they didn't come in. That day, that day we had 28 of our 29 linemen available to come in and start helping. The problem with this outage is it didn't last, it wasn't a day when everything went down. It lasted about three days before the lines kept falling down, and that was really a huge challenge. They put some up, drive away and more would fall down in the same area. It was really a huge challenge. We lost power to many of our rural substations because Minn Kota Power's main uh, transmission lines actually went down. That feeds a lot of our rural substations. So they had to get those back up and running before we could re-energize our substations. In the end, we had about 1,200 poles that went down, which was the second worst storm in the history of our cooperative. Uh, in 1997, we had 2,200 poles go down during the blizzard ice storm and flood that we had in 1997. <laughs> this is what our outage map looked like that day, which uh, this was actually, at, I think, the 25th. But not good. <laughs> when you see something like this, this doesn't mean, like in those red, red circles there, that's hundreds of people out of power. This particular graph is probably close to 6,000 people out of power. And that's more when Minn Kota had their major transmission line outages as well. We probably, without Minn Kota's outages, we probably had over 2,000 out of power. So how do we deal with something like this? You know, this goes back to being prepared. You know, this isn't necessarily something you want to be good at because that means it happens a lot. <laughs> but I think in general we handled it quite well. You know, I, I think obviously those that have to go out and fix this understand that that's their job. That's what they go to work for. That's where the hero and then comes out to put these lines back up. But it takes a lot more than that. It takes, we actually have a planning uh, session set up where we establish an incident command center, you know, to make sure we have somebody in charge. And that was Jody Bullinger, did a phenomenal job. Uh, we have need public information officers. So we needed to make sure that we got information out to the public. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we had operations chief to coordinate restoration efforts. We had scout teams that had to go out. We'd go scout or drive these lines. We have 2,800 miles of line. We didn't have to drive every 2,800, but we, had, we drove them one day, and three poles are on market, sent it into our control center. Well, two days later, 10 more poles went down. We had to drive it again. Some of these times, we had to drive these poles, uh, our mat, or these roads, three times to assess the damage. So that took a lot of time to do that. And then you have to have to obtain, obtain inventory. We don't have 1,200 poles in our in our pole yard, you know. Or do we have the cross arms? Or do we have the splices or the wire? Whatever it takes to put the power line back up. We had to obtain all that material, and that that just doesn't happen overnight. And then if you bring in help, where are you going to put them, and feed them, you know? So the coordination coordination efforts were amazing. And then if, you know, if in a situation like this, you, we can actually get reimbursement through FEMA. So we got to make sure we track 
everything correctly to make sure in the end we can apply for FEMA funds to get some reimbursement. So there's a lot of, that goes on behind the scenes versus just putting up the power lines. We actually brought in mutual aid from uh, 15 cooperatives in North Dakota, Minnesota, and South Dakota. We had 103 linemen in addition to our own helping to restore power. Uh, we did over 20 radio and TV interviews and that was both, both Paul Mathis and myself were, were out there trying to get the word out of, hey, this is not your normal event, you're gonna be out for days in a lot of cases. Some were out, the longest duration was 10.6 days. Imagine being out of power for 10.6 days. <laughs> In the rural area, they understand that more, but in town, if that would have happened in Fargo, I think we would have, it would not have been good. <laughs> in the, and I just want to say again, the employees just really, really shine through this whole process. And we're extremely grateful to the help of our neighboring electric cooperatives. I talk about cooperation among cooperatives as a core value or of cooperatives. These are the cooperatives that helped us out. Just did a phenomenal job from Sioux Falls, South Dakota to crowing to cooperatives in our neighboring area. The challenge is, is we're, we weren't the only one that had problems. So Dakota Valley south of us, uh, west of us was Northern Plains, Nodak Electric had some problems. So there was a lot of regional problems with outages in addition to, to our area. So in conclusion, you know, electric cooperatives have a long and successful history um, of developing rural America. And I think that's something we'll never uh, forget. Uh, cooperative business model is working and has many advantages in the utility environment and really I think the only model that should be used for de delivering electricity I think it works great future power supply like I talked earlier is is a concern um, and for you students again we have a lot of career opportunities for you to consider in the cooperative world and that is the end of my presentation are there any questions that anybody in the audience has that I could try to answer for you Questions for Marshall? Craig? Yep. <clears throat> this question is probably coming from my perspective is more on the ag side. So I think about like the food versus fuel debate with corn usage going into ethanol, soybean going into renewable diesel. What are you guys seeing on the electric side? You had mentioned Bitcoin. You mentioned these data centers, especially with AI. You know, kind of that question of these, these things of the future. One can make an argument of do you need Bitcoin? but we need electricity for our homes, right? So I'm just kind of curious what you guys are seeing on the, um, the electricity side around that kind of debate. Well, like I said earlier, the, the power needs for even Bitcoin mining, you know, it's really Minn Kota's job to make sure that they, if, if we have a customer come to us that says, I want to put a plant here to do X, that we can supply it. We've denied plants because they just are too big. So we do take that all into consideration. The, the thing about our transmission network in this region is it's nearing capacity. So if we have a huge load that would come on, we'd have to add more transmission. And there's a, a transmission, um, study is the right word, but uh, through MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, they're looking at the needs for transmission in the future to supply to this region to make sure that we can not only bring power here, but really we need to get power out of here. North Dakota is long on producing electricity, and we need to make sure there's transmission available, not only add, add power to new loads, but if we produce electricity through wind or solar or whatever it is, that we can ship it to other parts of the country. Uh, but it's a great question uh, when it comes to, we can't prioritize. You know, we, don't, we can't say, no, we're just going to serve the residential business and not serve that data center. We would make the decision not to serve the data center because it's, it would be too large for us to serve with our current resources, as, if that helps. With that, can you give us an idea of what the power, power, kind of power draw you're talking about? I don't know that everybody understands when you talk about Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good I mean, question. It's, it, it's massive. It's huge numbers. I don't know, Matt, if you know those numbers. So our, our current uh, our system load for 58,000 accounts is about 250 megawatts, roughly. We have one Bitcoin mining load that's over 100 megawatts. We don't. Minn Kota does. One. So yeah, I mean, if we had five of those, we couldn't probably serve it. We, I know we couldn't serve it. 
So that's absolutely something where we look at. And, and the draw from AI, the AI computers are very similar. I mean, the, the amount of power draw coming off of these are just astronomical. And one of the reasons that this region is attractive to some of those folks is because we are cold. They, they, they generate a tremendous amount of heat. And we got a built-in deep freeze, at least for most of the heat. <laughs> um, you open up the doors, you run the fans, and you can cool your computers, right? Um, versus if you're in Atlanta or if you're in Texas, it's a completely different perspective and try, how do you keep those things cold? I was at a conference recently, and I, I don't quote me on this, but. I believe the gentleman said that for, for AI data centers in the future, I think we're currently at about 15 gigawatts of required capacity, and that is expected to go to 45 in 10 years. So to Frayne's gigawatts, to Frayne's point, a huge amount of electricity, <laughs> but yet we're reducing the amount of baseload that we have in the future. That's, that's the concern we have. Yeah, I give you a sense of perspective. So if you have a really large data farm at 500 megawatts, so Marshall talked about, we have 35,000 square miles, the International Falls to Devil's Lake, from the Canadian border to roughly the South Dakota border, right? So that, imagine that footprint. Our peak load on a cold day is 1,100 megawatts. A data center is five. So building about, you know, 50 feet by 500 feet, uh, uses uh, half of the energy we use in that entire region. So it'll give you a sense of perspective, yeah. right? So it's a gigantic amount and they're continuing to grow and as we all take our phones and take pictures and every piece of data gets captured somewhere in the world and people continue to use that, the phenomenal amount of energy that gets utilized. So it'll be interesting as we, to your question about how do we serve all of this as it continues to continues to grow. So, you know, because with, with some of the labor challenges we're currently facing as well, we continue to face, we're gonna lean really hard on technology and in particular AI and help us out with that. And, and so this, I mean, we know it's coming. It, it's a matter of pace, it's a matter of scale. It's how, how do we prepare for it? It's, these are huge, huge challenges. <laughs> Glad you're preparing. <laughs> no, other questions from Marshall, I'm sorry. Other questions for Marshall? So I got, I got one. So what would you consider to be the highlight of your career? What is it that you're most proud of of the time that you spent within, within Cass County and Cass County Electric and the electrical industry? Well, I, I think there's probably a few, but I, I think there's, I'll, I'll say probably two. You know, I think if we look historically back in the 90s, uh, specifically in probably early 2000s is, is at the time our, our goal in life was to sell electricity and that was my job and we did uh, because we had a tremendous program to sell electric heat and in that amount of time in about 15 years we put about 2700 heating systems in apartments and, and homes in the Fargo West Fargo area the second thing I think is being able to lead an incredible organization like Cass County Electric as, as the CEO, you know, and to, to work with a team of employees and, and, and staff that is just incredible, and to watch the employees just do phenomenal work. You know, what else can you ask for, right? In the end, I think, you know, we look at our, we, our mission as a cooperative and what we set out to do and what we accomplished, it's exactly what we wanted to do. So that's, I'm very proud of that. Excellent. Anything, any other questions? Thank you very much, Marshall. We appreciate you.